Hello and welcome back to the Discworld Lore series. Happy Holidays! For here on Roundworld it is the season of goodwill, festive cheer and all the other attributes that make people feel better about themselves if they think they have them. It is indeed the time of year we know as Christmas. The Discworld does not, of course, have Christmas. It is an Earth construct based on a random conglomeration of ideals and themes from faiths ranging from the birthday of a chap who's supposed to be a big deal, and some chaps in togas in Italy praising their sun god, all accompanied by the trees popular with some pagan chaps. Now, the Discworld tradition of Hogswatch makes a lot more sense, which is probably why you can tell it's the fictional one, honestly. Let's begin, shall we? The holiday takes its name from the time of year in the height of winter where the animal farmers would slaughter their beasts for their meat and enjoy a feast of the best bits before saving the rest as food for what would last them the rest of the season, such as chitlins or processing it into sausages. Primarily celebrated in the Stowe Plains, the Circle Sea and the Ramtop regions of the Disc, but with the rise of Ankh-Morp Orkian culture it has spread around along with it reaching into places as far away as Uberwald. Due to the resonance effects of multidimensional phase space thingamies, it does indeed share many parallel features with the Roundworld traditions we know and tolerate annually. These include the cutting down and dragging into a home of a relatively blameless fir or pine tree, before covering it in colourful paper, glitter and glass objects in the hope that this will somehow make it feel better about the whole situation. People also use the event as an excuse to sing jolly songs and rove the streets, doing so often in front of people's houses until they are paid to go away. This is the season also where it is more agreeably an excuse to indulge in copious amounts of hot or warm alcohol, presumably to try and make the singers more bearable. Feasting is also common in keeping with the farming routes of the holiday, with in particular our old friends at Unseen University going overboard as always on the dinner preparations, but in a way that is greater than even they normally do. With a massive banquet that goes long into Hog's Watch Night and often into the following morning, with such culinary delights on offer that most sensible was to stockpile a selection of indigestion and antacid remedies in preparation for the gastronomic perfection to come, while some even even take the otherwise unthinkable step of skipping some of the smaller meals in the day in preparation for the night's events. For any of my listeners familiar with the relationship between wizards and their meal timetable, that should go a long way to illustrating the magnitude of the feast. Another carryover from Roundworld is the love of annual stories that are associated with the time of year, and its thoughts of charity and goodwill while also having an undertone to the more depressing aspects of the human condition. For this reason, when combined with the narrative imperative that infects Discworld on a metaphysical and indeed metaphorical level, every year we'll see kings or the local empowered landowners bagging up their spare food, often that which was taken as a tithe from their working classes in the first place, and traipsing through the snow to give it to one of said members who happens to cross the king's path of vision while working hard, thus allowing the king to feel like he cares for the people while enjoying their often very nervous and hesitant, thanks in exchange for the bounty of food. While I am by no means a cynic, honest, it does occur to me that the more self-conscious kings keep an eye on their working populace and select the peasants that they know will react well with the suitable level of gratitude and may even have done something to actually earn it this year. As such, keeping an eye on their work schedule in order to look out when the snow lay round about, at the appropriate time to see the correct hard-working destitute soul, so that he can be overcome with seasonal goodwill and go about his customary role in the ever-repeating story of life. Other stories of the season that will, alas, always force themselves to be replayed are less amusing or heartwarming, such as the fate that befalls the city-dwelling match girl, destined to die in the cold on Hogswatch night. To those aware of the machinations of stories, this one often strikes a particular nerve, and the people and beings with the power to intervene in stories of this kind will often do so with a will, just to spite the need to kill a blameless girl for the sake of pathos. In the words of a personification used to justify his own role in preventing a match girl story on one famous Hogswatch night, There is no better gift than a future. On the subject of gifts, those too are a large part of the Hogswatch tradition and the purview of its personification. But before we get to that part of our tale, there is one more tradition of Hogswatch Night which I would like to discuss with you. While it is less important and world known than others, it is one of my favourites. You see, the Ramtops Hogswatch tradition is that witches must not go out that night. Like all other rules, however, this is one that the witches will observe at their entire personal discretion, though many of them are perfectly willing to go along with this one. 
Granny Weatherwax, for example, typically uses it to get a good night's sleep for a change, while her lifelong compatriot and apparent friend, Githa Og, observes the tradition in her own way. She does indeed stay at home, but invites everyone else to come in as well, holding the largest and most enjoyed Hogswatch party in all of Lankra. Although, to be fair, given the sheer size of the extended Og family, merely just inviting them would probably account for a good quarter of Lankra's population in attendance. Now, as to the gifts mentioned before, much like our round world holiday, people give each other Hogswatch gifts, and children can expect a stocking full of sweets, treats, small toys, and things designed to make noise at 5am above the fireplace in the morning. On our own world, of course, we have the figure known variously as Santa Claus, Old Saint Nicholas, Saint Nick, Father Christmas, and even Kris Kringle. Narrative imperative would be lax in its duty if it did not put a similar figure on the disc, and indeed there is such a personification. He who is known as the Hogfather. He who can deliver all his gifts around the world in less than one night, filling every stocking and eating all the pies and drinking every sherry left for him. Riding in a sledge pulled by tusked boars named Gouger, Ruta, Tusker and Snouter, with himself a pig-like appearance, a rotund, round face with a small fat nose and large tusk-like teeth poking through his lips. Dwelling in his own realm as many personifications do, in his case, near the hub of the world in the winter-locked lands, resides his castle of bones. Though the legends of the Hogfather have shifted through time, he went with them. He was, in the first, a winter god of the death and renewal variety, celebrated through many different ceremonies and festivals. His roots lie in the midwinter hunts for wild boars, where there was nothing but the panting of the men and the beasts and the blood they shed, all knowing that someone's life will be ending before the sun rises. Or in the prehistoric king-making rituals of the pagan cultures, where the small, smart, priestly men would palm a hard bean into the dish of a man they believed would make a good leader for the time, making a kind of peace until the time came for the winter sacrifices, when the king would once again come to the attention of the priesthood and their knives, ready for the whole cycle to begin again with a new year and a new king. As such, the red and white of the Hogfather's fur-lined robes are the colours that reflect the blood upon the snow in the moonlight, rather than the signature tones of a popular and somewhat delicious soft drink. As he grew towards his modern form, he became known as a spirit who gave households pork products, and to those naughty children, a bag of bloody bones, a superb implied threat if there ever was one in a farming community where everyone from a young age is well aware of how butchering works. Now more heavily commercialised in the way that humans always enjoy doing, the Hogfather's role is more deeply important to humanity than this might otherwise be apparent. He is, in many ways, the most outward expression of belief in the world. This may seem small in the grand scheme of things, and in many ways he doesn't have belief in the same way as gods do, which is perhaps why he is closer to an anthropomorphic personification. But at the same time, the human capacity to believe, which supports the Hogfather, the gods, and the rest of the personifications, creates a space for the deeper meanings such as justice, mercy, duty, all those things that have no existence in our physical world, but which everyone believes in their heart of hearts must be real for there to be a point to anything. What Hogswatch seems to stand for is not that you will get presents if you have been nice, but that what you have done counts for something and is known to have counted, that everything matters. Ultimately, all things strive. Without our deep intrinsic belief in our own humanity in the world around us, the sun would not rise every morning. Indeed, nothing but a ball of flaming gas millions of miles away would illuminate our planet through sheer happenstance and the movement of planets throughout a system. The deeper philosophies behind the Hogfather and Hogswatch, as explored in the novel with the former's name, is perhaps one of Terry Pratchett's most meaningful books and a personal favourite of mine. It is in many ways an exploration of Christmas and a satire of it, but it is also its justification, cutting through all the tat and commerce that has come to surround it to the true heart of perhaps why it is humanity's most popular time of the year. Despite the snark about it I have myself employed in this video, it is the one time of year I always look forward to, and 
I truly hope you all do too. A time for family and for thinking about what truly makes us who we are. Thank you everyone for watching. I hope you have a most enjoyable holidays and indeed a Merry Christmas or a Happy Hogswatch to your preference. I look forward to seeing you all with more Discworld content in the new year, but as always I have been Albion, goodbye for now.